So when you put together the group, um, I think what everybody loved about Wu Tang is that everybody had his own his own style and his own role, right? You had like Meth for the ladies, and you had like Ray do the street shit, and you had like just uh, almost on some like philosophical shit, and obviously you guys and uh, Dirty doing the Madman stuff or whatever. So, uh, oh. <laughs> Did you uh, put them together, like when you put them together, did you already have in mind like, how the whole characters and the whole personalities could work together or was it more like they dope and then like recording the stuff and being on tour the whole personalities developed? Well, I knew, the, I knew their personalities already. Like I said, I made a lot of songs with them already. Um, you know, one thing about Wu-Tang is that everybody in Wu-Tang, they didn't know each other. You know what I mean? Um, but they all knew me. So I would tell Chilsa, yo, this guy named Method Man, he has the craziest flows, he's the panty raider. He, you know, um, you know, his name was actually Shaquan the panty raider. But when he came to my house one day, and he always smoked a lot of weed, and weed is called Method in, in my projects. So he would come to my house, we smoke a lot of weed, and he made a song called The Method Man, right? And I was like, yo, you are the Method Man. <laughs> you know what I mean? He was like, well, fuck that, I'm the method man here. Yeah. You know, and Raekwon, you know, his name was Shalaw. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, I was like, you, 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 you got the most style of slang. His words, everything you say is so slangy. I was like, you got flavor like a chef. So you're the chef. To old dirty bastard, yo. You know, his name was Aeson Unique. I was like, nah, you're the dirty bastard. You know what I mean? So I, I, I realized their styles and their techniques, and I put a name to it. You know what I mean? The Jizza was actually the genius at first, and Old Dirty gave her the name The Genius, and gave me, you know, I have the name of Scientist. But when I said, you know what? I'm not gonna be Prince Rock King no more. I'm gonna be the Rizza, you know what I mean? And you're not gonna be the genius, you're gonna be the Jizza. You know what I mean? So I thought of all these things, and um. And, uh, and all my brothers agree, you know what I mean? So this sounds like you already had a bit of a plan, well not a bit of a plan, a hell of a plan together because from your learnings from like the recording industry before that and like all the kinds of, you know, names and roles and putting together groups, so when Protect Your Neck hit and became as big as it was, were you surprised at all or was it like, yeah, this needed to happen? Uh, I won't say I was surprised, I knew that we was going to fuck it up, man. I'm not saying that to be egotistically, but I knew that Wu Tang was gonna fuck the world up, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And um, we did it, yo, you know what I mean? We was, you know, you're young, you're very conceited, you're very ego, you know? And that's good, <laughs> because you gotta have your ego and your energy that drives you. If you look at somebody like, you know, Mozart, you know what I mean? All the other pianists thought he was crazy, but he wasn't crazy, he just was the best. He didn't give a fuck, you know what I mean? And that's how we felt about our music. You you mentioned New York a lot. Do you think that anywhere else in the world something like Wu-Tang could have happened or something, st such music could have been created anywhere else in the world? Oh, that's a good question. But I would say yes. I mean, because, but, but not during that time. During that, during that time, it had to happen with us. But now, it can happen anywhere, yo. I mean, I remember coming to Germany years ago, and it was like no German rappers really at first when we come. I mean, one or two groups, you know what I mean? And um, I remember um, I, I gave I gave some students here. I gave them five thousand dollars. I said I said because I said you should start a company and 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 help rap grow in Germany. Yeah. And they they took it and they they you know they. I don't know what they did with the money, but <laughs> no. But I think you know, I, re I realized by traveling the world that everything develops itself in time. Then I came back here in Germany um, years later, and you had all these different rappers. You know, like in, in, in like in seven, eight years later. You know what I mean, at first you had you know um, ten, then nine, it became a hundred. You know what I mean? I'm a cool survives coming up out of here and um, 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 cursing all these guys, you know what I mean? And then you got a whole nother generation of German rappers, you know what I mean? They take us to the next level. So um, the same thing happens everywhere, man. You know, hip hop is uh, something that belongs to um, our generation and it, and it blossomed down to go to the next generation. 
you you mentioned like all those pop rappers that were out that were out at a particular time, like you know the Young MC and like MC Hammer and Little Lies and all of that stuff. So um, when Wu Tang hit, it was also people also said they brought like the East Coast back because obviously Dre was going hard at that time and like the Snoop record came out. Did that even matter to you? Like, you know, the whole bringing the East Coast back or bringing New York back? Or was it like, I don't even care? Like, did you listen to any Dre stuff back then? Was that an influence? No, to be honest, I didn't listen to Dre stuff back then. I, I wasn't really aware of, of uh, what he was doing. But, but Ray Kwan was aware of Dre. Because I remember he would tell me, you know, uh, N.W.A., you know, Dr. Dre, the motherfuckers is dope and shit. And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't pay attention. The first time I, I paid attention to uh, Dre was when, when, when Doggy Style came out and Master Killer bought the album and we was on tour, he was playing it and shit. And I was like, yo, this shit, this shit sound good, yo. But some other Wu-Tang guys like, nah, nah, get that shit out of there. I mean, cause we were so much onto our own. But then, you know, this, I realized that, yo, what he was, what they was doing was unique as well. The quality of their music and the sound of their music. But that's being, that's just good music. But hip hop, to me, is gritty, raw. You know what I mean? Like no, 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 it's, there's no, it's no, you don't have to polish it up or nothing. It's just, it's like a, when somebody write graffiti on the wall, it's like, this guy just make it crazy however, however his hand feels. You know what I mean? Dre, by the time he was making uh, his music, he already knew how to make songs. You know what I mean? He had hit songs. I wasn't trying to make hit songs. I was trying to make hip hop so when people hear it, you drive faster. You know what I mean? Fucking, you, 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 you break out of prison if you want to. Most producers are making songs for you to dance to. I wasn't making music to dance. I was making music to fight. You know what I mean? When, like, hip hop. Bring the motherfucking ruckus! You know what I mean? That was the thing, that's why we liked it. Even guys like us could feel hard at that time. Like, yeah, bring the rockers. Um, but seriously, um, when people like, you know, from an art perspective, when people draw a line from hip hop producers that were out there before you to you, it's mostly Marley Marl who's mentioned as like the guy who came before you. Would you say that he was a big influence? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think Marley Marl was dope. Um, you had uh, Lost Professor. Um, Diamond D, Q-Tip, Tribe Called Quest, of course, you know what I mean? Prince Paul was crazy, you know what I mean? Um, so, and, 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 um, and you know, there was, was, was a few other producers that was, you know, that maybe made one song and things like that. Those, it was all dope. What, the difference with me, I think, was that these producers um, and Pete Rock, but these producers, they was not MCs. You know what I mean? They was not graffiti. They was not graffiti writers. You know what I'm saying? They was not break dancers. I was all that. And when I made my music, I made my music, like I said, so that people could MC rap and fight to. I didn't think about the clubs, none of that, yo. You know what I mean? So I think I brought that to the table. And then one thing I did learn from uh, Prince Paul was Prince Paul would fit anything in his music. You know, he was sampled from Mickey Mouse Records or Three Is the Magic Number and all this shit like that, right? And, you know, I was like, well, there's no rules to what you're doing to make some crazy shit. And so I was like, shit, I love Kung Fu movies. I'm putting Kung Fu movies into my music. You know what I mean? And this would help me build this landscape. And then while everybody was looking for James Brown breaks and looking for, um, you know, disco breaks, I was listening to slow soul music and finding that that could be turned into hip hop. I mean, by chopping and cutting. I want to say one thing, like, when I first started producing, the samplers didn't have no auto chop, you know what I mean? It wasn't something where you could take a sample, put it in and, and chop it up and pitch it. I had the tapes bit by bit myself and make these things happen. Then, then maybe five years later, the industry like, you know, Roland and Yamaha, and these guys started making samplers to do what took me hours to do, you know what I mean? 
And so I help inspire them on how to make music equipment better for us.